see, 17 people online. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Doris Lee. Um, hopefully you can see when I'm waving. Uh, so Doris uh, started working with me about five years ago. Um, so her, she did her undergrad at UC Berkeley. It's really hard to speak with a mask. Now I know why all the <laughs> faculty are complaining. I'm not teaching this semester, so I don't have this issue. Um, so she was an undergrad from UC Berkeley. She uh, did her uh, undergrad in astrophysics and physics, and she applied for a PhD program. I didn't actually advocate for her admission. Uh, there was another faculty member who she initially joined, and then at some point she knocked on my door saying, hey, I wanna work with you. That was awesome. I was excited. Um, after sort of working with her for a semester, uh, she just like, uh, got me completely amazed at what she could accomplish. Doris started working on a range of visualization recommendation systems over the course of her PhD. She worked on Zen Visage, which is an already ongoing project, but she took it to places where we were not envisioning it would go. Then VizPilot was another vis visualization recommendation system that Doris worked on. She worked on a third visualization recommendation system with some Tableau folks, uh, folks at Tableau Research, and then finally, Lux, which is a super successful visualization recommendation system. To me, it's a culmination of a lot of work that we've been doing in the space for the last decade. Doris took that, took all of those lessons and then actualized this in the form of a system that is being used by what, like 50,000 people, if you, if you take uh, the download count. So uh, she's, uh, most recently she's been, taking some of that work and then trying to commercialize this as part of a company. She's a CEO. Uh, I'm, I'm also part of the company. It's been great to work with her in this new role. Um, so Doris, you wanna take it away? Thank you, Aditya, for the introduction. Um, yeah, it's, it's really great to be back in South Hall. I haven't really been back here since uh, the pre-pandemic. So it's really good to see all of you here and um, those that are joining virtually. Um, so maybe as a, a roadmap of uh, the talk today, my presentation shouldn't take the entire two hour slide, it should be around an hour. So for those of you uh, who need to probably leave early or anything, um, it shouldn't take that long. Um, and we'll have plenty of time for Q&A uh, towards the end. Um, let's see, oops. Yeah, so as Adidia mentioned, uh, the talk today will be an overview of some of the projects that I've been working on during my PhD. And the goal of this talk is to kind of share a mix of anecdotes and some of the uh, honest reflections of uh, this body of work and highlighting um, what we found to work and things that didn't work. Um, my hope is that some of these stories might at least provide some uh, few data points uh, and food for thought for future system designers in this space. And so if you're interested in more details about any of these projects that I talked about today, um, feel free to check out my dissertation, which is uh, published and up at this link. Okay, so data is increasingly becoming kind of the center of decision making across many organizations. And data analysts often perform exploratory data analysis to discover valuable insights from data uh, to inform their uh, analysis. And so the well-known statistician John Tukey describes the exploratory data analysis process as an attitude and a willingness to look for patterns and trends that are in your data sets. And this dissertation sort of focuses on supporting EDA through the visualization of data. And this process is commonly known as visual data exploration. So visual data exploration helps analysts identify trends and patterns detect outliers and anomalies and make sense of and tell stories about their data. And over the last decade, we've also seen the success of many visualization uh, systems and frameworks that empower the uh, non-technical uh, end users, uh, for example, designers and uh, business analysts with very highly usable tools to generate these visualizations. And at the same time, we also see that there's a trend towards visualization interfaces and languages with increasing levels of declarativeness. So these are typically used by data analysts, uh, practitioners, and data scientists. And these systems sort of abstract away some of these low level details of visualization design and programmatically synthesizes these graphical encodings. 
However, even with the advent of these incredibly powerful tools, there are still challenges that hinder the flow of data exploration. For instance, um, let's say that we are uh, planning to plot this bar chart visualization. We actually need to first think about what this visualization should look like, what graphical encodings and mark we should choose. And also there's a question about the data. So what portion of the data should we look at? How do we process this data correctly? And furthermore, note that plotting a single visualization is just one tiny point in this vast space of exploration options. So the analysts typically have to go through this very tedious process of navigating through large numbers of decisions in order to find their relevant insights. And so what that means is that even when they end up with what they're looking for, they might miss out on important insights that are in their data sets. Um, and another common problem is that the analysts might not even know uh, what sets of operations they need to do in order to get to these insights. So they can often lose track of where to search for these insights or get stuck in the analysis. So to solve these problems, uh, there's a class of visualization recommendation systems that have been developed to guide users in the process of data exploration. And so the goal of these systems is to showcase interesting patterns or insights that might otherwise take a lot of manual searching to find. And there's also been decades of research on these systems dating all the way back to uh, Jock McKinley's uh, APT systems, and this was back in the 80s. And so a while back, I wrote this Medium art article piece where I surveyed and reflected on the histories, uh, the history of visualization recommendation systems and discussed some of the present challenges. So some of these systems make recommendations about what data to visualize, while some of these other systems uh, focuses on recommending the most effective visual encoding for some selected data subsets um, and, or data of interest. But unlike the specification tools that we saw earlier, um, the adoption of these visualization recommendation tools is fairly limited. So this dissertation builds on top of this work on visualization recommendation systems. And so our goal is to understand and understand how automated assistant aids vis the visual data exploration process. So we call these types of systems visual, uh, visual exploration assistants. And in particular, what we were looking at is how to better design these systems to provide a computational assistant across um, various modalities and interfaces and um, essentially to facilitate more effective analysis. So our primary thesis is that these visual exploration assistants can be helpful to the analysts by making them more productive and effective in their exploration workflows. So building towards this thesis, uh, we th synthesize and explore the design space of these systems across two axes. First, we distinguish between systems that support a single type of analytical task versus general purpose systems that supports multiple types of analytical task. And then in the second part of this dissertation, we also contribute to understanding how how to design visual exploration assistance and guidance across different interface modalities. And in particular, we looked at how, um, how did this, uh, in particular, we looked at distinguishing between code and GUI based interfaces. So the chapters of this dissertation actually samples the different areas in this design space. And so our aim is that this exploration of designs would contribute to a deeper understanding of the benefits and the pitfalls of visual exploration assistance. So with that, I'm going to uh, jump in and talk about our first uh, project, uh, which is a project around uh, our first uh, visual exploration assistant uh, across this thesis direction. So this, uh, this project, VizPilot, uh, was published at IUI and it was done in collaboration with Himal Dev, uh, Huizi Hu, Hazan MLG, and Adidia. So the primary uh, problem that we were solving um, in, this, in this project was that visual uh, data exploration is a very common step for understanding multidimensional data sets. And one very common way of understanding these data sets is through what we call a drill down analysis. And so what is a drill down analysis? So for example, let's say that we are looking at a data set of 
uh, the 2016 US election results. We can see on this chart that the percentage of voters for Clinton and Trump is comparable. Now, if we perform a drill down, which is essentially applying a data filter to restrict the subset of data that we're looking at. Uh, so in this case, we would be visualizing only a subpopulation. Um, it's not working. Ah, okay. So in this case, uh, we would be looking at a subpopulation in uh, African-American voters. There's actually a dramatically higher percentage of votes for Clinton compared to the other candidates. So as we can see, the drill down analysis is a very common operation that analysts uh, use to compare the effects across different subpopulations. And detecting these types of changes across the subpopulations essentially leads to the discovery of insights. Now, drill down operations are often applied in sequence one after another. And we can think of the space of, the space of possible drill downs as a lattice. Um, so at the very top of the lattice, we had, um, we had the overall distribution, which is an aggregation across the entire data set. And then horizontally across the first le level of the lattice, we might be interested in looking at fe the female voters distribution or the distribution of voters in California or, and so on. And going deeper in the lattice allows us to narrow down uh, the data subpopulation even further through the conjunction of filter predicates. So for example, we can look at the vote distribution of females in California or white Americans above 65 years old. So notice that the number of nodes in this lattice grows exponentially with the number of attributes and values in the data set. And so in order to reach a particular node in this lattice, uh, there's a large number of potential paths that you can actually take to get to a, a subset of the data. And given this very large space of visualizations that you could explore in the lattice, it's often very hard to keep track of all of these visualizations while you're conducting an analysis. And so to illustrate one of the unique challenges associated with manual drill down analysis, let's take an example scenario of two campaign managers, Alice and Bob, who is interested in studying how vote behaviors varies across different demographics. So to perform this task, Alice looks at the bar charts of the percentage of votes across each candidates. And she first examines the overall voting pattern. And then she drills down to the African-American subpopulation of the data. And she notices how the African-American vote distribution looks different compared to the overall distribution. So she finds that this is very interesting. And now for Bob, uh, Bob starts with the same overall visualization, but he drills down to the female vote distribution. And he finds that the subpopulation looks very similar to the overall distribution. And so he further adds an additional drill down by adding African-American as an additional filter. And at this point, he finds a significant skew towards uh, votes for Clinton compared to the other candidates. And he decides that this, uh, this particular visualization is an interesting finding. So how can Alice and Bob be looking at the same data set doing both drill down analysis, but reach two very different conclusions? So this is a classic example of what we call a drill down fallacy in this work. Um, so here, Bob was unfortunately misled into thinking that the African-American female visualization shows a particularly interesting trend. But in fact, this phenomena could actually be explained if he had seen the African-American visualization that, um, that Alice saw. So attributing the wrong cause to an effect can lead to a detrimental mistake in the decision-making process. And in this case, the flawed insight might lead to uh, incorrect allocation of campaign funds. So to resolve these challenges, we've developed a system called VizPilot that automatically recommends a dashboard of visualizations by selecting a small subset of visualizations to summarize the key distributions for a given data set. So without diving too much into the technical details, this visual exploration assistant not only conveys something that is interesting, but it also ensures that, uh, that, we, uh, that the analyst doesn't fall prey to the uh, drill down fallacy. 
And you can find more details of the study and our system in, in our IUI paper and the thesis. Um, but we also performed a user study that actually demonstrated that in general, VizPilot is able to guide participants towards more informed decision-making compared to two other existing approaches. And the automated assistant provided by VizPilot actually conveys an interpretable narrative that helps users compare and contextualize the data that they're seeing. So we've seen how VizPilot provides users automated assistance in a single task of drill down exploration. And continuing along this direction, we're going to look at a second analytical task, which is the process of exploring line chart patterns. So this second project, Zen Visage, uh, is a work that is done in collaboration with a group of students from UIUC, Professor Kerry Karahelios and Adidia. Um, and this work has been published at Viz uh, in 2019. So line charts are one of the most commonly used chart types for illustrating temporal patterns and trends. However, analysts often have to go through this manual and error prone process of examining large numbers of visualizations in order to just search for a couple visualizations that corresponds to a desired pattern. To solve this problem of manual search, visual query systems have been developed to enable users to visually specify the patterns that they're looking for. These existing systems often allow users to sketch their desired line chart pattern, and then the system returns a set of visualizations that best matches that sketched query. So these visualizations are essentially ranked based on ones that look most similar to the ones that the user has sketched or the ones that are least similar. And even though that these visual query systems seems like the perfect tools for a lot of the uh, practitioners that we talked about who had the problem of um, pattern line chart pattern search, we found that these tools are actually not adopted in practice. So our goal with the study was to understand how visual query systems can actually be adopted in practice by engaging participants in astronomy, genetics, and material science over the span of a year in a user-centered design process. So this collaboration led us to develop a Zenvisage, which is a system that allows users to specify a pattern of interest through either sketching, inputting an equation, dragging or dropping an existing visualization, and the system automatically performs shape matching between the query pattern and other possible visualization. And this essentially returns a list of visualizations that are ranked based on ones that are most similar to the ones, to the, to the ones that are least similar. Um, at any point in the analysis, users can adjust various system level settings to control what visualizations they're searching through and how these patterns are being matched. They can also browse through a list of recommendations to learn more about the common patterns and outliers in their data set. After our year-long collaboration, we conducted an evaluation study where participants brought their own research questions and data sets to analyze. Our study of these, um, the real-world analytical usage uh, of visual query systems helped us identify a taxonomy of three sense-making process, which is common in these systems. So we'll now discuss some of the uh, findings that, we, um, that, we, that is related to this taxonomy. So one of the most surprising findings from our study was that despite the prevalence of these sketch to query systems in the literature, only two out of nine of our participants actually found the direct querying via sketching to be useful. And this is partly because participants often didn't have a clear idea of what patterns to search for. So for example, um, we spoke to an, a geneticist uh, in our study who relied very heavily on the provided recommended patterns to jumpstart their queries. And so even when they do have a pattern in mind, so for example, in the astronomy use case, the data might be too large or noisy to find a desired match. Um, so for example, this astronomer uh, in our study was trying to query based on the sketched pattern, but because the data is very noisy, the return result doesn't really match the pattern that he's looking for. So he instead uh, filters the data down to a smaller subset and only look at, looks at objects that have been classified as a star in order to see if it would return a better match. 
We also did a more um, task-oriented analysis of the actions that are taken by participants during the study. And so for more details on this, you can check out uh, chapter three of my dissertation or our VAST paper. So after uh, looking at uh, Zen Visage and VizPilot, um, we had a reflection around um, the, the tasks that are supported by these visual exploration assistants. And so taking a step back and revisiting our diagram again, we've looked at how Zen Visage and VizPilot accelerates users across a single visual exploration task. However, real world inquiries actually um, often consist of a diverse range of analytical tasks, each requiring different types of recommendation and guidance. So as a result, in the, first, uh, in the later half of my dissertation, we look at how visualization recommendations and assistant, uh, assistance fits into the user's analysis workflow and the natural, intuitive, natural and intuitive steps uh, that users ask questions and explore their data. And in particular, our next project, Frontier, looks at how different categories of recommendations are employed in a mixed initiative visual analysis workflow. So this project was done in collaboration with Vidya Settler and um, Melanie Torrey at Tableau Research, along with Carrie, Carrie Carjalios at uh, UIUC. Uh, so as we saw earlier, there's a lot of existing visualization recommendation systems that supports um, recommendation categories based on some single analytical task. Um, so but there's also the question around how these recommendation categories support an analysis workflow. And this is a very underexplored area in the research literature. So there isn't really a consensus or formal study around the differences in usage across these recommendation categories. Um, as a result, what we did was a systematic literature review of 20 existing visualization recommendation systems. And as part of this exercise, we were able to distill 10 major types of analytical actions, um, essentially grouping these recommendations into categories. So in, in this taxonomy that we came up with, these actions can be thought as transitions or operations performed on the current visualization state to produce the recommendations. And taking an example, let's say that we are looking at the, this uh, scatter plot visualization, we can actually apply something called an enhance, which is an action that adds an attribute to the current visualization state. Another example action is called a filter, which can, where you can add an additional filter while keeping the X and Y attributes on the axes fixed. So we implemented all 10 of these recommendation categories into a, uh, from our taxonomy into a system called Frontier. And we use the uh, Frontier system as a design probe to perform a mixed method study um, to compare Frontier against a baseline. And in this baseline condition, the participants saw all the recommendations that they would typically see in Frontier. However, the categories are removed so that the recommendations appear in a single grid layout. Our user study confirmed that the recommendation categories are indeed useful for facilitating visual exploration. It also helps users understand and interpret the visualizations um, in a much easier way. We found that there were individual differences across these recommendation categories and specific categories, for example, like in enhance or filter were the most useful. So th those were some of the findings that we came up with, including the taxonomy as part of Frontier. And the design implications that stems from the study provide the unique opportunities for general purpose um, automated assistance um, as it forms the bedrock of the next, projects that, uh, the next project I'll, that I'll be discussing. So before I jump into this next project, uh, Lux, I'll, um, I'll provide a little bit of a personal backstory in terms of how, how we led to the design of Lux in the first place. So around the time that I was wrapping up these three uh, projects, Zen Visage, Viz Pilot, and Frontier, 
um, around late 2019. I also moved from uh, UIUC to Berkeley and I was kind of looking for the next project to work on. And I did what any good HCI researcher would do, uh, which is go out there and talk to some users and data practitioner in the wild. And largely this was uh, informal conversations around how visualization recommendations would actually fit into their day-to-day -day workflow and um, how these tools that we built might be useful for their data science work. And based on those conversations, it was very clear that recommendations would be useful and some sort of automated assistant would actually help users um, get to quicker insights. And users were very excited about the idea of these uh, effortless recommendations. However, um, for the practitioners that we spoke to, these recommendation tools work like magic, but nobody was quite uh, adopting these tools. Most people that we spoke to has never heard of these systems and they're rarely being used uh, consistently in real world data analysis workflows. And so based on our experience in building Frontier and Zenvisage, it was also not entirely clear that building yet another visualization recommendation tools with more bells and whistles in terms of uh, features and capabilities would actually make a dramatic difference in terms of how people would use and adopt these tools. So one problem that we actually saw was that these systems often assume that the story ends when the user discovers an interesting insight or in the form of a visualization. But in reality, actionable insights often arise when visualizations are used in conjunction with a host of different um, analysis uh, tasks or workloads from data wrangling to uh, machine learning and modeling. And another point of friction is that almost all visual exploration assistants, including the three that I just talked about, are based on uh, graphical user interfaces. So it actually means that there's a huge disconnect between the programming tools that um, data scientists are familiar with using. So for example, computational notebooks versus the BI tools or other charting tools that exist in these graphical worlds. Um, our users often told us that they were only ready to put their data sets into our visualization systems when they have uh, fully cleaned up their data, understood what the schema looked like, and gotten rid of all the data quality issues, which kind of defeats the purpose of exploratory data analysis in the first place. And more importantly, the cost of having to import and export to and from these different tools often presents a barrier to exploration. So to minimize the point of friction, this was the starting point of this final project called Lux, which is to think about how can we integrate some of these nice visualization recommendation and guidance into a user's typical workflow, namely within a computational notebook. Um, and this is done in collaboration with uh, many students at Berkeley, as well as uh, advised by Marty Hurst and Adidia. So earlier, we kind of hinted at some of the challenges that comes with visual data exploration. But in the notebook context, this, there's even more challenges due to the very high effort that's actually required to, um, to visualize your data programmatically. So not only do we have to think about what this visualization should look like, the graphical encodings, some of the things that we talked about earlier, we also need to translate all of these specification details into code. So here we're showing two examples of just the sheer amount of code that is necessary to generate a single visualization in matplotlib and plotly. So these are two very popular um, uh, Python visualization libraries. So the substantial amount of programming effort that's required for visualization often hinders exploration, especially when the users only have a vague idea of what they're looking for. So to address these pain points, uh, we've developed a lightweight visualization tool on top of the Pandas data frame called Lux. And the goal of Lux is to make it easier for data scientists to explore their data by automatically recommending useful and relevant visualizations to the users whenever they print out their data frame. So I'm gonna show you a quick demo, a live demo of what Lux can do. Okay, so wait, I can't actually see this here. Pretty big. You can't see it. Well, I can't. It's a different. 
screen than mine, so I can't operate on it. Uh, Maybe I'll just move over and like yeah. look at that. Or you can temporarily do mirroring or something. That's the other option. Is it this one? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Let's make sure that the screen. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Cool. So what I have opened up is a Jupyter notebook, uh, and this is um, commonly the platform that a lot of data scientists use to explore their data. And in order to use Lux, all you have to do is uh, do this import Lux. Um, and one of the things I forgot to mention is that uh, Lux is a layer that sits on top of the pandas data frame. And the pandas data frame is a very popular um, library that is used for data analysis, data uh, transformation, and manipulation. So um, in order, after importing Lux, um, you can use the pandas data frame and the API as is. So in this case, what we're doing is we're loading in a CSV file um, into a data frame. Okay, so once you, you, you can use the same API and pandas to, it, to be able to load in your data. And once you print out this, oh, this is weird. Live demos never work. Oh, that's strange. No looks. No looks. Maybe I was debugging something. Um, let me pull up. Uh, this is, binder. yeah, the binder one. Just pulling up a different demo. It should work. The slightly different demo, but hopefully it should work. Oh, it's the same demo. Okay, so sorry for the hiccup. Okay, so now we've loaded in the data frame into a CSV file and we print out a data frame. Um, it's kind of slow, surprisingly slow. It's normal. Okay, live demos sometimes don't work. <laughs> Uh, this is strange. Do you want to um, instead pull up the GitHub page and then walk through the features? Lux yeah, the yeah. I, no, actually, I have slides for this. Maybe I'll, I'll just skip the demo um, this time and then. Um, I'm going to go straight into the slides. This is actually the first time where a live demo didn't work. So that's a uh, pretty surprising. Let me just um, mirror back the display. And okay, so I'm going to walk you through what you're supposed to see on this demo. Um, and, and we could go from there. So in the demo, um, what you should have seen is that, um, actually, I'm just gonna jump into like the, the actual examples. So Luxus essentially is a um, visualization layer on top of the Pandas data frame. And what that means is that um, Lux provides visualization recommendations directly into the Jupyter notebook environment via a very tight coupling with the Pandas data frame. So as you're walking through this notebook, uh, by, print, by just printing out your data frame, Lux actually recommends, uh, you could see that there's a little button on the top left-hand side whenever you print out the data frame for you to toggle between uh, the pandas table, which is the, the tabular table and representation that's shown by um, pandas 
And you could toggle between that and a dashboard of visualizations that is recommended to you by Lux. So Lux provides this alternative way that data frames can be visualized at any point in their analysis. So you could do this printing of the data frame at any point. And so this visualization is always on in the sense that users can toggle back and forth between these complementary views. And so sometimes this is useful when there's tasks that are more amenable to the table view. So for example, if you wanna get at the structural information and schema information of the data frame versus other cases where the recommended visualizations might be more useful to get a quick visual overview of your data set. The other thing that we do in Lux is that we also preserve exactly the same data frame commands as you would in Pandas. So meaning that all the nice API and functionalities that you get from a Pandas data frame, you can still get with Lux without having to change a single line of code. So what we could do is we could do all the quick data cleaning and transformation. So all the code on the left-hand side that you're seeing here um, is the same as this um, you would specify in Pandas without having to move um, sort of to a different visualization library or to a separate uh, GUI interface uh, for charting. We can update our visualizations right away when we print within the notebook. We also, um, one of the things that we would see in the demo, uh, we would have seen in the demo is that data frames can actually be attached to an intent. And the idea of an intent is that it's a high level signal or a specification of what, the visual, what visualizations we should display so that it's relevant to what the users are interested in. Um, so Lux provides this flexible and expressive language that allows users to specify their analysis interests. For example, uh, what they're interested in, what attributes and values um, they, they wanna look at in a very sloppy way. And Lux will automatically infer the underspecified details uh, to determine the appropriate visualization mappings based on best practices. Um, and so for more details about how Lux is implemented underneath the hoods um, and some of the performance experiments and user evaluation that we've actually done, you can check out uh, chapter six of my thesis or the Lux paper. So this leads us to the third reflection, which is designing a visual exploration assistant uh, for real world adoption. And so one of the most rewarding things during my PhD was to see the growth of the open source community for Lux. As a researcher, it was really amazing to see that a visual exploration assistant of this sort uh, can be realized to its full potential and its applications in the real world. Uh, so to date, um, Lux has been downloaded for more than 60,000 uh, times and has over 3,000 stars on GitHub. And these tools have also been adopted by many data scientists and practitioners spanning a wide range of industries to drastically accelerate their visual, exp visual exploration experience. Uh, a lot of users have even written blog posts, tweets, and made YouTube videos, all talking about how Lux can be used in their own workflows. And some academic users have even incorporated this into their um, university teaching curriculums. So revisiting our thesis, uh, we find that visual exploration assistance can indeed help users in performing better visual data exploration more effectively within their workflows. And to sum up, my dissertation explores these two dimensions of designing automated assistance for visual data exploration. First, we built on top of existing work on visualization recommendation systems, and we demonstrate that there is value in accelerating users towards a specific single exploration task. And we do this by eliminating this manual work that is required in the exploration process. And second, we also argue that it's not simply enough to just provide the recommendations but instead, we need to think about how, to, how proactive recommendation and guidance actually fits into a user's analysis workflow, and even across different interface modalities. So we argue that the research and develop, future research and development in this space uh, along both directions are essential for designing an interactive data assistant that works collaboratively with users in a mixed initiative visual exploration workflow. 
So finally, um, this is a thank you slide. I wanted to thank my advisor, uh, Adidia, for all of his support and mentorship over the past five years. I also want to thank um, uh, Marty, Marty Hurst and Joe, uh, my committee members, for sharing their perspective and just the wealth of knowledge that they had um, around visualizations, HCI, and data management. And it, their perspective has greatly uh, contributed to this thesis. I also uh, want to thank my uh, collaborators from Berkeley, UIUC, and during my internships at Tableau and IBM. Um, and finally, like the, all the work, the four projects that I talked about would not be possible without the amazing students that I've worked with uh, over the past couple of years. Um, they have made uh, these systems to, to the point where you could actually um, write the paper around it and to the point where you know, we seen a lot of open source success in, in this space. Uh, finally, I wanted to thank my family for supporting me throughout the past five years. Okay, so wrapping up, uh, thank you for listening. And as, as Adidia mentioned uh, earlier, um, I'm starting a company around some of this uh, work in the data science tooling space. And if you're interested in any of the things in this talk, um, come talk to me after, uh, afterwards or shoot me an email. I'm hiring and would love to chat, chat with everyone. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, and I believe we also have the ability to take remote questions. If you're remote, raise your hand for, if you have to ask a question. I don't think I have a way to see the questions. I am monitoring. I don't okay. see any questions yet. Oh. I can ask one. Okay. Because, yeah, I was just like very impressive and inspiring. Thank you. Uh, like portfolio of work. Um, yeah, I want to hear your thoughts about what do you think that would lead to the next biggest leap towards recommending more relevant and more even inspiring recommendations like I, I want to hear more about that actually like be it understanding your users better writing better rules or is it incorporating either internal or external intelligence like say like if they pipe into ML pipelines to get some signals from there or even have some external ML models that predicts users content. Mm -hmm. what do you think the space of innovation is towards making better recommendations yeah that, that's a really great question um, I'm just gonna repeat the question for like the online uh, people. So I think the question is mostly around what is kind of the next step in terms of you know uh, the visualization uh, exploration assistance space, and in particular, is it better ML models for predicting like user intent, or is it better like recommendation accuracy? Or um, there there's many directions. Um, I think one of the things that was interesting. Um, earlier on in some of the, the first two work is that they were very much focused on like, hey, is this recommendation actually useful to the user? So that's more of an accuracy question, right? Like, is, it, is the recommendation that you're recommending actually useful uh, and relevant to the users? And there's some very objective way of measuring it. Um, as I sort of started working on Frontier and Lux, uh, what was really obvious uh, to me was that even though the objectives were really important, um, it was also the, the presentation layer was also just as important because a lot of the times you need to make sure that people have access to these visualizations and that, you know, as, as I mentioned in the talk, not just in a separate sort of environment. So I think that presentation part and how it fits into the workflow will still be very important. And it might not just be in, like Lux definitely explored the notebook context, but we haven't explored like different interface modalities. So for example, like natural language or speech, how would, it, how would that play in with that? So I think that's definitely like one direction. I think the machine learning thing is definitely like also um, something that a lot of people in, in the literature have, have, um, have looked at. And 
Um, it's definitely an interesting direction. I think the challenge there is being able to learn from the corpus of uh, either user logs or interaction data and being able to tease out like what are the user intent and how, how that actually fits in with um, the visualizations that we would recommend. And given that visual data exploration is kind of this unstructured process, it's very hard to actually tease that out from the logs of data. Um, but it's definitely a, a very interesting research problem uh, for the future. I don't see any other questions online. Um, I'll ask a question. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think we've, we've had this come up in various conversations, but if visualization recommendation systems are great because they tell you what to look at, but um, uh, but they also prevent, they also discourage creativity, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because you're you end up falling into the trap that these are the only directions you should go into and no other directions are valuable. How would future systems safeguard against things like that? Any thoughts and reflections? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. And I think um, uh, there's, there's definitely a lot of papers uh, in the literature that talk about, you know, what is the danger of an assistant, like an automated assistant like this or visualization recommendation systems in, you know, causing users to like fall into fallacies or biases, um, or even like uh, help accelerate the process of like p-hacking, right? Because you're doing all of these hypotheses tests. Um, I think that it's definitely a very important objective that needs to be incorporated into um, into whatever recommendation um, the like internals. Um, so far, I think most of these systems, except for VizPilot, we focused a lot around like um, re relevance to user intent and uh, interestingness of the data. Uh, so we haven't explored that aspect as much, but I think it's definitely a more and more important thing as we have more data and more powerful recommendation systems that are going towards this general purpose direction. We have a remote question. Okay. So Cameron asks, can you comment on the intent portion of Lux and the general problem of learning to communicate effectively with an assistant? Do you have any guidelines to share about what makes for an effective or less effective human AI collaboration? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of like questions packed into that. Um, but I think the, the first part is around intent. So maybe I can go back okay this is oh okay you're no longer sharing screen those oh am i not sharing screen anymore okay let's see yeah, so what Cameron was talking about is this idea of um, the user intent in Lux. And the, the user intent in Lux is intended as this high level way of communicating with the system and saying, hey, here are the things that, you know, attributes or values that I'm interested in, but uh, show me something that's related to that. So the current um, model that we have in order to support this relevance is based on uh, the taxonomy that I showed in Frontier. So you could show ones that are, you know, building on top of this visualization. So this is kind of small, but you can see on, on, on the screenshot on the left, um, you have something where it's um, users have specified, hey, I'm interested in this variable called inequality and average life expectancy. And I want to show, sh like, I want Lux to show me everything that's related to that. So you could actually, add an additional attribute, or you can add an additional filter. And those are some of the relevant, um, like relevant actions that we actually came up with. Um, currently, there isn't, um, isn't a way to uh, do relevance beyond um, the, the actions themselves. Um, but I think there's also a very interesting question around the specification of intent. Um, in Lux, we rely on the users to specify like, hey, I'm interested in these attributes. You actually 
have to write down explicitly. In some of the past systems, this was done through interaction. So in Frontier, you, you would click on these um, shelves or this, these buttons with the names of the attributes and your clicks essentially is an intent that you're interested in those attributes or you're interested in adding those attributes onto the canvas. Um, I think in the future, there's definitely very interesting ways where you can incorporate implicit intents based on maybe uh, past actions that are done by the user. So for example, if the user, you know, uh, is working with the pandas data frame and they dropped an entire column or they renamed an axis. That's some level of intent that tells you, hey, these, these, um, these attributes are not just like kind of uniform, like the user is interested in one thing or the other thing. So there's definitely opportunities there in terms of bridging that intent with the recommendation and making that specification process more seamless. Marty? Uh, uh, great. So uh, Lux has a certain set of visualizations built in right now for the intent show, uh, but uh, it's now influenced other tools mm -hmm. out there, like uh, Observable, say, that has, I'd say, uh, a wider range of visualizations that are shown. Mm -hmm. What do you, are you, you know, what's your view on, on the future of, of visualization types and are you satisfied with the visualizations that have shown or how can one figure out the right visualizations to show? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, yeah, as Marty mentioned, there's a lot of systems that are now doing this type of embedded visualizations within either a notebook workflow or some sort of notebook-like environment. And um, there's definitely an interesting question of like, does it always make more sense to show more visualization types? Um, there's definitely systems where it takes a data frame and then plots, you know, 15 different visualization types. And not all of these visualizations are necessarily sensible. I think with Lux, we've really, with Lux and the Frontier model, we've really tried to craft that experience of showing you at most three action, three or four actions at the same time. Uh, so the action organization is a way for grouping together and categorizing visualizations that are similar or alike. Um, and so I think so far, it seems like most of the data analysts and data scientists that I've spoken to, um, that natural categorization is something that makes a lot of sense. And it's also a way for us to pack a lot of visualizations into the same place without them being too distinct. So the, the Frontier study actually demonstrated that this grouping together or the categorization helps a lot with the understanding of the visualization. Um, going back to the kind of the customization aspect of your question around like, does it like in the future, does it make sense to support more of these types? I think as people are adding in additional things um, to these recommendation systems, they, there's definitely care that needs to be done in terms of not making that too overwhelming or um, showing too many things at once. Um, and thinking about at every stage in your analysis, what really makes sense versus ones that um, might not be relevant uh, at that point. Um, yes, that might be it. I don't see any other questions. So thanks cool. again, Doris. All right, thank you. Maybe this one more. Oh, maybe this one more. Okay. I think there's. Uh, how about the use of color, uh, uh, color of the visualization for colorblind users? Yeah, uh, we haven't really delved into like the accessibility of visualizations uh, that much in the in our visualization recommendation work. It's definitely something that is very important as a future direction, and there's there's a lot of amazing work um, and papers that have been published in this space. So those. Uh, those literature definitely can inform um, tools like Lux and other uh, visual exploration assistants in the future. Okay. Cool, awesome. Thank you so much for attending the talk. Cool. All right.